Recorded live in the Phantasmo Lounge, high atop the Sugatochi Komada building in beautiful Midtown Chesapeake, Virginia, it's Phantasmo After Dark with your host, Rob Floyd, and co-host, Professor Tony Mercer. Hi, Rob. Hey, Tony. Glad you could make it and join us again. It's been a little while. Yeah, I heard you missed us. We're back. (laughs) I brought my pencil. I missed you, but I'll improve my aim. Hey, how about you there? Okay, enough shtick. <laughs> never, think, ne- never enough shtick. Never, stick. never enough shtick. Never too much shtick. Yeah, you know, I don't think I've got anything to promote or publicize coming up anytime soon, really. The next Phantasma is a few weeks away, and so we'll talk about that later. So let's jump right into it. Yeah, I didn't mention our topic tonight in, nope. that, in that intro. I mean, the announcer didn't mention our topic tonight in that intro. Tonight, we're talking about Godzilla versus Megalon. Yes, my favorite Godzilla movie. Not saying it's the best one. I'm just saying it's my favorite <laughs> one. That's all. <laughs> Gojira Tai Megaro or Megalo. What he said. That's what Sounds like Michelob. I, 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 you know, I understand it why, does. They, yeah, I understand I like why they changed it. Now, you know, I saw this movie. The first time I saw this movie, I saw it in a theater. Uh, I was a little kid. My mom took me to the Great Bridge Twin Theater on, a, I think it was a Sunday afternoon. And it was a bunch of other moms and dads with the little kids in there. <laughs> And I got to see the, I mean, you know, the first Godzilla movie I got to see in a theater and is maybe that's why it's my favorite, but I think it really, it's my favorite because of Jet Jaguar and who doesn't love Jet Jaguar. If you don't love Jet Jaguar, I don't think we can be friends. Well, since we're talking about Jet Jaguar, yes, uh, who, you know, I, originally, and I read too, now that originally this was going to be a, they were trying to do a Jet Jaguar solo movie and it was going to be Jet Jaguar versus guy again. Or I'm sorry, J- Jaguar versus Megalon. But they started getting into production of it or pre-production and the powers that be decided that J- Jaguar wouldn't be able to carry a whole movie. An unknown, like, you know, character. So then they add, that's when they added Godzilla and Megalon in and they rewrote the whole thing. Does that concur with what you know? Well, that actually happens uh, or variations on that theme happen a few times throughout the history of the uh, Toho Godzilla films, particularly the first yeah. wave of them. And if you look back into the 60s, there's a couple of pictures where Godzilla is not even in the original title. So in the in the U.S. Yeah. release or international title, he was Invasion of Astro Monster, which was retitled yeah. as uh, Godzilla versus Monster Zero. Yeah. Right? And it wasn't this, like the second one wasn't released over here as Gigantus the That's Fire right. Monster yeah, yeah. or something? Yep. Yeah. Godzilla Rays Again was renamed Gigantus the Fire Monster. And I think reference it was Gigantus, right? References to Godzilla were... Yeah. Not made in that original. I think dub. so, yeah. It's been a long time since I've seen that one. Yeah. Well, I've, it's been a long time since I've watched any part of it dubbed as Gigantus. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, as well, you should. I sort mean. of left that behind. <laughs> but anyway, so yeah, Godzilla vs. the Sea Monster is actually Ebira Horror of the Deep. And okay. uh, the story I always heard, and I don't know if this has since been refuted, but the story I've always heard was that it was always meant to be a, multi, a, a, a monster mash, a multi-monster oh. picture, but that... King Kong was originally supposed to have uh, been in the slot that Godzilla took. Oh, wow. And if that's true, and again, uh, you know, it, it's these days, it's easier than it used to be to get a hold of behind the scenes information. Oh, for, God, yes. uh, this stuff. So uh, it might have been refuted, but the the fan talk was always that. Yeah. It was supposed to have been King Kong. And if you watch... The picture, it even makes sense that it would have been King Kong at the scripting stage because, you know, they've got that bit in it where Godzilla is uh, enamored with the native girl. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, And some other, uh, you know, very Kong-like behaviors for Godzilla. <laughs> for Godzilla, yeah. yeah. Does it climb a building at all? Uh, no, not that okay. I recall. Yeah, it's been a while since I've seen it. I don't know. <laughs> uh, now, it seems to be you're the, the Godzilla historian in the room here. <laughs> Well, the more knowledgeable of the two of, of us on Godzilla uh, films in general. R- relative scale, I'll take it, okay. sure. Is there, or it seems to be there is a, there are different factions of Godzilla fans is where there's a, the there's the original film. Yeah. Everybody loves. The consensus on that is pretty, pretty general. Everybody loves the original film. But then it goes on to where Godzilla becomes a good guy or the kid's hero. And there's people like me <laughs> that love those films. And there's a faction that that does not like those films and really loves the stuff after that or at least loves the uh really is into the, i get what was that the 90s stuff or the early 2000s yeah, stuff 90s. which and early 2000s i'm not a huge fan of i can you know because i like 
I like Godzilla being a good guy, <laughs> but I don't dislike him. But is is that a is there a division in the gods in the Godzilla community like that, or am I just reading into it? Uh, you know, yes, to some extent, I feel like that has lessened. Yeah, over the years, just in terms of my own experience with uh, the fandom, as it were, which yeah. is you know pretty much <laughs> on the internet and amongst the handful <laughs> of uh, people that we know that are into this stuff. Yeah. I definitely think there people always have their favorites and fans always debate things. Oh, yeah, of things. course, of course. But in terms of, of there being sort of active factions for the, yeah, I'm getting the different a, eras, whole, you know, old kiss, new the kiss different eras of Godzilla <laughs> movies, I think that used to be more of a thing than it is now. But it's really, in my experience, not so much. I mean, everybody kind of has their opinion of whether or not they like or prefer superhero Godzilla from, yeah. you know, force of nature tearing yeah. up. Uh, tearing up Japan rather than defending it. Yeah. Uh, but it, but in my experience, it really breaks down more about th- th- there are three distinct series uh-huh. uh, of God or three distinct runs yeah. of Godzilla films that usually are considered to be eras unto themselves. And so the, okay. the initial run of films, the initial series or, or era is usually referred to as the Showa era, right? Yeah. That's yeah. A, uh-huh. Uh-huh. That is a, uh, a Japanese term. That refers to, I think, I think it has something to do with the, the reign of a particular emperor. Isn't that right? Good, good. It sounds familiar. Yeah. Yeah. As I recall, <laughs> uh, it, it is tied, it is tied to the imperial lineage in some way. Yeah. So uh, there is a, a Showa era of Godzilla, which is the original 54 film through 1975's Godzilla versus, or Terror of Mechagodzilla. Sorry. Okay, okay. Godzilla versus the Bionic Monster. Right. So basically, Toho was making Godzilla films or fantasy films with Godzilla in them. Yeah. From 54 to 75 consistently. Okay, uh-huh. Then they stopped. And yeah. then Godzilla was revived in 1984 with Godzilla 1984 or Return of Godzilla, whatever you want to call it. Uh, or Raymond Burr lives again. Right. Okay. So you had that movie in 1984, which was wasn't that 80 wasn't cut it with Raymond with, well, it was cut with Raymond Burr put in and dubbed uh, and released here as Godzilla 1985. Okay. All right. But you know the, the experience of Godzilla 1985 and the experience of Return of Godzilla or not Godzilla 1984, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> okay. Are very the experience of watching those two. Pictures are very different. I really like Godzilla 1984 a lot. I have oh. no use for Godzilla uh, 1985. You know, I've never seen no that, that see version. I'll have to check that I mean, out. Even as a kid, I found it disappointing. Well, um, yeah. It was exciting just to be able to see a new Godzilla movie, but it was, you know, disappointing. Yeah. But anyhow, so the, the 80s period of Godzilla really only contains two movies. They did... One, and then it took them a few years to do another, which they did in 1989. And then they finally got that series rolling properly and it continued until 95 when it was stopped to allow for the tri-star iguana godzilla oh right? okay yeah, yeah um so that era is uh, referred to as the heisei era which is a, again a japanese okay. uh, term for marking an epoch that ties somehow into the imperial lineage gotcha now uh after the tri-star picture failed to spawn a uh-huh. franchise Toho started making Godzilla films again with uh, Godzilla Millennium, a.k.a. Godzilla 2000, which actually got a, a yeah. uh, release here. Brief which I, release I enjoyed. We, we went to the theater and said, right. saw that, yeah. And that kicks off another cycle of Godzilla pictures. Now, the years in which those were made, 99 to 04, uh-huh. I think, technically that's still the Heisei area in terms of marking Japanese epochs. Oh, okay. But fans usually refer to that as the Millennium series yeah. okay. to, to differentiate yeah. it from the Heisei series yeah. because the Millennium Pictures in the Heisei series, they are different, different approaches. Oh, they have, yeah. They have a different look and feel, yeah, definitely. markedly different um, designs for Godzilla. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> well, the, the suit, you know, from 84 to 95, the suit changes several times, but he definitely has a consistent look. Yeah. Um, and then he has, a, you know, a couple of different uh, looks in the Millennium that are, again, very different from the... yeah. The Heisei period. Oh, so, oh, so, so I think, getting back to the original question, hey, tangents. <laughs> I think it that happens. that any sort of division of eras has more to do with liking one of those 
better than the others. Yeah. And I think maybe to, to some extent that has to do with uh, in a, a fandom that skewed older at one point than maybe it does now that we're deeper into the internet area yeah. era and everybody has Could access be. to everything Could be. Could be. or whatever the case may be. But I feel like, and it might just be the locales I haunt it, yeah. could, it could be that there's still a lot of this sort of uh, division that goes on that I don't see because I don't see it. But, <laughs> but I feel like there's less of that now. Honestly, w- what I have noted is that, and, and this is what goes on in my brain. So th- uh-huh. this could be something that no one else really identifies with but me. But the thing that is relevant to me, I would say, that I have noted as something of a division are folks who love Godzilla movies and the way that Godzilla movies are traditionally made are part of what they love about it. Yeah. Okay. And folks who love Godzilla as an idea or a character or an image, and that's why they love Godzilla movies and they are indifferent to the way in which the movies are made. And the, and what I mean by that is I'm following you on the one hand, you've got folks who, the use of models and suits. And again, the way that stuff is traditionally made and shot is a part of the appeal. Yeah, of course. And that's, that's what they're looking for. And there are some folks who I saw this really sort of come to the fore when the pre-production on the 2014 Godzilla was happening. Oh, okay. People who love Godzilla, but if you could replace all that stuff with fancy CGI, they'd be thrilled. Right. Oh, it's like, uh, like, yeah. like, like they're just sort of tolerating the way in which Godzilla movies are traditionally made because it's sort of feeding their fantasy of what Godzilla is. But yeah. if you can use fancier special effects uh-huh. to get or more modern or whatever you want to call it, special effects to get to something closer to their ideal Godzilla, uh-huh. that's those folks are all about that. Oh, you know? OK. Yeah. And yeah, and I can see that. and are very enthusiastic for the legendary pictures and all yeah. the all the sort of American uh, uh, giant monster kaiju yeah. theme things that are happening. Your Pacific Rims and your yeah. Kong Skull Islands and, and whatnot. Whereas which, I, which I'm interested in seeing that, but I'm not holding high hopes for it. Yeah. But I'm interested in seeing it. Well, the legendary Godzilla shocked me by not being terrible. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Did, okay. did, you, did you think it was terrible? Uh, you talking about the latest one? Yeah. Or the latest two? You know, I didn't even see it because I can't stand that design. It looks like he doesn't have a head. Yeah. It's like a neck with a mouth on it. I completely agree. And that just completely turned me off to the whole thing. Because the star of the picture doesn't look like the star of the picture to me. Yeah. You know, and it's not. it's just not an appealing design and I don't want to see it. Yeah. I was curious about the film. How it was overall, yeah, but I just I I couldn't stand to look at an ugly design. Yeah, I agree. Now my take on the design as it as it appears in the film was I didn't like the head. Yeah, I, I liked everything else. Didn't like the, the head. rest of it looked great. The first time I saw pictures of it again in the promotion before the movie came out, I didn't like the design. Period. And you know how I get about monsters and robots oh yeah it's all about <laughs> design. Well, I mean it it's is like, though. That's those, what they are. Those Michael know? Bay movies. Transformers movies could be great movies or they could be what they are, which is terrible. Yeah. But they botched it right out of the gate with those horrible looking robot designs. That look like a trash heap walk. And therefore I just don't care. Right. Exactly. It has to look cool. If I don't want to buy that toy, <laughs> you've already failed. That's right. Anyway. So when I saw it in motion in the movie, I warmed to everything but the head. The rest of it I thought was okay. Yeah. But you know, I collect the X plus Godzilla figures. Oh, yes, which, you do. Which are really accurate representations of, in the case of the traditional uh, Toho Kaiju, the suits. Yeah. Oh, yeah. They're beautiful figures, too. But they God. made a legendary Godzilla oh, X plus uh-huh. figure. So I'm back to liking the design less now <laughs> because the X plus <laughs> figure is a really great accurate representation yeah and i look at that thing and i'm just like my god it's ugly the arms are too long and beefy yeah. and the head is just exactly as you it's described a, it, a mouth on a neck yeah. and I, I just don't know what they're it's going like for it was designed it. to be filmed by at one angle yeah to look cool you know but not <laughs> you you know what you make a good point and that that might very well be why in the film where you don't see it a lot frankly uh-huh. and, the, and 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 what you do see of it they're going for beauty shots um, it works okay. Yeah. Uh, but just to see it 
dead on in a figure or in a still or whatever. You just go, what the hell is that supposed to be? Yeah, yeah. But, I, you know, I was saying, I... I, uh, I like the suit at Godzilla vs. Megalon, which looks great from everything. <laughs> oh, oh, we'll get to that. I was that for a segue, but which the, we're not ready to get no, back to yet. <laughs> I was just going to say that the legendary Godzilla was not terrible, and my expectations were so low that the movie probably played better for me. <laughs> Yeah, I still have plenty of complaints about it, but I feel like it was, you know, for all my complaints, the design being a big one, it was respectful to Godzilla as a character in a way that I never expected it would be. And and, oh, and it must okay. be understood. Godzilla is yeah. a character. Oh, well, yeah. Now, the nature of that character has changed here and there throughout its its lifetime. It, yeah. Again, taking us right into the superhero era of Godzilla. Da, da, da. But I feel like in the character of Godzilla as sort of a, a force of nature who is sometimes helpful and sometimes a force of destruction to mankind is sort of cemented in the 90s series. Uh-huh. And, uh, and, and I think that's sort of come to dominate the idea of what Godzilla is as a character. And I think the legendary movie captures that aspect quite well. Oh, okay. So I'm not dead set against. I mean, I, I'll see the Kong movie if they if they do a Godzilla you know versus Kong. I'll certainly see oh, that, yeah. <laughs> of course. But not this. It's not the same thing. No, you can make a CGI Godzilla movie that's great, and I'll enjoy it, and I'll say it's great. Not the same thing. No. Uh. Uh-uh. Uh. Uh-uh. Um. This world of Japanese special effects that was born from the Godzilla series. With the men in suits and the models and, and yeah, uh, the craftsmanship. Yeah, that that's that's what does it for me. So. Yeah, well, me too. I mean, I love seeing that stuff. You know, I think that's not the biggest, but part of the the most appeal or biggest appeal of those films is you like anybody watching them like seeing that stuff. You know, it's the if you want to call it quaint or whatever, you know. But I like seeing the craftsmanship and the detail they put in these things, and sometimes it's super obvious it's a little it's a little model but it's awesome (laughs) that they have it and there's something physical there that's working and moving and the guys in the suit they move a certain way that i don't know how good the cgi is it's not going to move like a guy in a suit is going to move yeah and it's just awesome and too you know how good looking some of the suits are some of them are Yeah, They, they don't look like it's a suit or a puppet i mean even though you know it is you're looking at like, where the hell are they looking out of? Or where's the seam? I don't see it. It's just great stuff. And and besides that, it's fun, goddammit. <laughs> where a lot of times the CGI stuff, it's just, it gets too serious and caught up in itself that it's not fun. Like Harry Hazen movies are fun or the Godzilla movies where there's physical objects there moving. And whether it's a dude in a suit or it's a model or a toy, you know you could go somewhere right now and see that physical object you saw in the movie. You can yeah. see it on display somewhere. You know, I, I don't mind kaiju films that are tonally serious. Uh, I don't insist upon it either. Oh, but, no, I'm but, talking about the effects take themselves too seriously. Right. Oh, I see what you, you know mean. what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Well, there, to tie into something that you just said, there, yeah. there is a sense when you watch the, the uh, it, let's call it A.G. Subaraya style special Uh effects that it's sort of like watching people playing with toys right Uh but but it's like (laughs) it's hard it's hard to to uh (laughs) verbalize this but watching sort of the best model kit builders play with their toys in a really skillful (laughs) way that probably doesn't make any sense but yeah but yeah you know and hey i like toys so whatever well who doesn't and if you don't you shouldn't be listening to this podcast. Well, 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 so, but if what you want is, you know, I want to be tricked into thinking this is real on some level. Yeah. I don't want to, I, you know, I don't want to get the feeling like I'm watching somebody play with his models or whatever. Yeah. Then it's not going to be for you. But I mean, the, the, the best on the surface of it when I'm watching these things, I am thinking about how it's done. I am marveling at how it's done. But then there's moments are sometimes long moments or whole scenes where I forget. Oh yeah. All about the fact that I'm watching rubber suits and, and oh, model yeah, sets. Oh yeah, definitely me too. You know, just just a just a great moment or a beautifully lit shot or or something that's really elaborate or cool or impressive or atmospheric or whatever it is that takes to sort yeah. of flip that switch and you forget all about it. Yeah, well, it's always to me watching them. It's Godzilla's doing this, Godzilla's doing that. It's not the guy in the suits doing this or the guy in the suits doing that. You know, <laughs> it's Godzilla's doing it. Godzilla's fighting. Yeah, of course. Yeah. 
And uh, even though I know it's a guy in a suit, I still get caught up in the fantasy of it and the fun of it. And that's the world that Godzilla lives in. Looks like that. And Tokyo looks like a model city or model cars in that world. Yeah. So, you know, I can get lost in it, even though I know how it's done and know what it looks like. And it doesn't take me out of it where bad CGI does. Yeah, you know, I think, and even good CGI when it's too good, and you know, it's like I know that's all done in a little square computer screen box. Well, the best you can hope for with that stuff is that you're not thinking about it, right? You're just not thinking about it at all. One true, way or the other. true. And it t- it took the technology for me a long time to get there. I think I think it it might have gotten there just in recent years to where I really stopped thinking about the fact that I'm looking at a computer image that doesn't quite yeah mesh well, with everything else that's going on. You know, a lot of times, though, I mean, I don't think about it consciously, but on a sub level, I kind of feel it. You know what I mean? Yeah, they call that the uncanny valley. Yeah, I mean, you could just, it's just, it doesn't feel the same as something, something filmed on a green screen set does not feel the same as something filmed on a location. No matter how good the CGI is. You know, getting at, yeah. at with the, the recent Star Wars films is a good example. This is the most recent one I can think of. The ones that were filmed digital and on almost all green screen sets good bad different indifferent how you feel about them i enjoy them you know not my favorite but i enjoy them it doesn't have the same feel as the more recent ones that were filmed more on location shots the individual scenes i'm not talking about the story at all well you know well, what i'm saying yeah yeah and i agree but i think the uh the thing that crotchety old dudes like us have to <laughs> amen <laughs> acknowledge is that We say something filmed on location doesn't feel the same as something filmed and then composited with a computer generated image. And I think we're right about that. But in the modern day, yeah, filmed isn't even a prerequisite. Well, okay. Right. I get shot on video for the YouTube generation. (laughs) (laughs) Things like this will matter less to future generations. God but hey, you know, from what I can tell, there's a lot of young folks out there who are still into this stuff. So bless them. And, yeah. uh, and this podcast is for you. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but hey, speaking of Godzilla versus Megalon. Hey, yeah. Uh, <laughs> somewhere down the road here. Yeah. So it's your favorite Godzilla it movie. It is my favorite Godzilla movie. And I can't remember if it was the first one I ever saw, but I know it's the first one that I, I got to see in the theater. And it just blew me away. You know, I was a little kid. I couldn't have been seven, eight, nine years old, whatever like that. And in a theater full of a bunch of other kids and guys looking on the screen and everybody's like, yeah, <laughs> you know, mm. and cheering and stuff. And, and of course, Jet Jaguar was just to this day is one of my favorite robot, you know, figures, characters or whatever. Uh, it's such a great look and design, like took the best elements from a lot of the other giant robots or whatever and just streamlined it made it look slick and i i you know i just why 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 was he not used in anything else he's such a cool looking character well the the series was kind of casting about trying to figure out what would work or toho was sort of casting about trying to figure out what would work to uh keep the the movies profitable at that stage. So yeah. that plus a lot of, you know, behind the scene personnel changes and shakeups within Toho are sort of the, the broad answer to the question. Yeah. Now, if I remember correctly, Jet Jaguar was submitted the, you know, the, the design that would become Jet Jaguar uh-huh. was submitted uh, as part of a contest, right? Yeah. Toho I, ran a contest. Did you mention that earlier? No, no, but I, I read that not long ago. Yeah. It was uh, like a young kid came up with a design yeah. that they, they said it was a cross between Ultraman and uh, like Mazinger, hmm. a great Mazinger or something like that. I think is what they said. Huh. I can see. Uh, you know, especially I can see, the mouth I can see a little great Mazinga in there. Yeah. Sure, the mouth yeah. line and the eyes a little bit. Yeah. But yeah. It, was, it was kind of a, a mashup or a composite of those two. And then somebody at Toho refined the design. And I think his name was Red Arone or Arone or something like that. But they changed it to, they refined the design and changed it to, uh, what, Jet Do- yeah, Jaguar. it was something Ronin or Ronin something, wasn't yeah. it? I don't remember which one it was. But yeah, Toho came up with Jet Jaguar. That's not what the kid had originally called yeah. it. But um, it's, uh, you know, and I saw I saw a picture not long ago, what, something I've never seen before in, in, in all my years. Thank you, Internet. A picture of the guy in the Jet Jaguar suit with the helmet off. 
So it destroyed my illusion that it was yeah. a real robot. <laughs> <laughs> But he still had the big, the big blue dicky, right? Yeah, but it looked awesome. It's like, <laughs> where's the suit? <laughs> I want to see the suit now. So, the reason why I think they were casting around to figure out, or casting about, I should say, yeah, figuring, uh, try, trying to figure out what to do next and what to go with to keep the series alive, and and there are so many different. I think we started to talk about this and kind of abandoned it earlier. So many (laughs) unused concepts and different things they talked about and uh we're going to try and make, including a bunch of movies that were proposed and dropped between 75 and 84. Yeah. That's a whole podcast in and of itself. Well, (laughs) plus I'd have to to refresh my memory on a lot of that stuff. But the history of why it was a struggle, I guess, to keep the series vital at that point is... Uh, The factors involved there are the same factors that led, I would suppose, to there being a superhero Godzilla in the first place. Uh Uh-huh. I mean, for the the movies take, you know, going from the sort of family-oriented sci-fi or at least a veneer of sci-fi approach that they had taken in the 60s into the place we got to in the 70s that sort of uh, culminates to a certain extent in Godzilla Megalon. Same reason, right? Yeah. And that is because of what was happening on television through the late 60s and early 70s in Japan. Okay. So when Godzilla first hits and becomes a thing in the series and they start making Uh movie after movie in the 60s, if you wanted to see daikaiju, giant monsters, and and, and flying saucers and uh, uh, things of that nature, you were going to go to the movie theater to see that. And the mid late sixties in Japan, that all changed in a big way. Now there might be some, you know, pre Ultraman, pre nineteen sixty six television shows in Japan that we know nothing about that were attempting to scratch that itch, but you know yeah. or Ultra Q, I should say. Uh but you know, where it really starts is when Eiji Subaraya, who pioneered the special effects techniques that were used in the Godzilla films traditionally, left Toho and started his own production company, Subaraya Pro. Oh yeah. Okay. Uh-huh. And they created a show called Ultra Q, which was an anthology series that, you know, did lots of different stories, not all of which had monsters in them. But in one episode they introduced this uh, superhero from space who became a giant to fight uh, invading monsters. And right? what was his name? Well, his name was also the title of the second series they made, <laughs> which was Ultraman. <laughs> and now with Ultraman, again, uh, Subaraya and his team are behind this. The folks that had pioneered the special effects techniques that Toho used, they were giving you Daikaiju every week. Yeah. And a, and a, and a superhero to beat him up. So now it wasn't necessary to go to the movie theater and pay to see Damn that sort you, of thing. television. You could get it at home on a smaller scale, on a cheaper scale. Yeah, yeah. But you could get it, and the success of Ultraman kicked off a whole boom of Henshin Hero and Daikaiju television that uh, happened in the 60s, and then it waned a bit and then morphed into a second boom of tokusatsu tv featuring the henshin heroes in the 70s yeah so we're talking about common rider and and uh inazuman and kikaider and those guys also another thing that was huge in the 70s that ties into godzilla versus megalon is the super robot so you had robots of course being a popular theme in Japanese animation, and to some extent, the live action stuff early on. Even Subaidaman. With Tetsujin, well, the early stuff, like Tetsujin 28 and yeah. Giant Robo and whatnot. But of course, in uh, I think it was 71, we get the aforementioned Mazinger Z yeah. or Majinga Z, if you will, <laughs> uh, where Go Nagai adds the. Uh, innovation of let's not have the kid be friends with the robot or pilot the robot via remote control. Let's have the kid sit in its head and drive it around. Yeah. Right. And so of course this was hugely popular and, and super robots became a fixture on Japanese television, typically in animation, but they did do some live action. Oh yeah. I mean, there's lots of live action giant robots in Japan, yeah. but the, specifically the one robot, one pilot sitting in the robot uh-huh. approach. There was a few of those in live action as well. Anyway, super robots, very popular all through the 70s and well into the 80s um, yeah. over there. Then we also had the Gamera series happen. And, uh, you know, by the late 60s, Gamera had taken the the super kid friendly approach uh-huh. where, uh, you know, the, the Gamera 
movies start off as a pretty straight faced Godzilla ripoff and then eventually morph into what you think of with Gamera, which is the, the one Japanese kid and the, <laughs> the one Western kid in their scout yeah. uniforms who are having adventures. And then Godzilla saves them from <laughs> aliens or, or I'm the sorry, scout uh, excuse me, Gamera saves them from aliens or whatever. So now you had monsters and robots and all kinds of neat oh stuff my. on TV all the time, or yeah. at least at least, it seems like when you look at the volume of that stuff that was made, <laughs> yeah. it seems like it must have been all the time to yeah. have accommodated all of that material. All kaiju, right? all the time. That's right. Four hours a day. And then you had competitions such as it was in the theater taking a, a, a markedly uh, kid-friendly, aimed directly at the little kid oh, yeah. approach. Plus, Subaraya gone. So yeah. With that alone, and, and Subaru was did not completely d- you know divorce himself from Toho. He, I think he did some some consulting and some other yeah. stuff for them, but still, it was it was a knock to them when their resident genius was gone. And, yeah. and the, the special eff- some of the special effects and the prodigious use of stock footage that comes after Subaru's departure oh, is sort of a yeah. testament to his absence. Yeah. Let's say that. So all of those factors culminate in the Godzilla movies that we get in the 70s, where the identity, the sort of consistent identity that the 60s movies seem to have, and they did, is no more. And you are getting to sort of experimenting and trying different things. The psychedelia of Hedera <laughs> yeah. and the, the sort of wacky comic adventure of Gigan and then the 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 Megalon. Which is, to me, and this is both its great strength and its great weakness, uh-huh. it's like watching an episode of one of these TV shows I'm talking about stretched out over 90 minutes. Oh, I, I can f- fully see that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I've probably talked enough. Rob should talk now. <laughs> what is it we're talking about? Oh, yeah. I got something for <laughs> No, but what I was getting at earlier, though, is, you know, just the design of J- Jaguar alone is such a neat design and yeah. a sleek look that I'm surprised they didn't take advantage of it and fit him into other things or or do something else with the character. Yeah. I mean, he showed up, I think they, I don't know, they there were a couple of action figures, and since then there have been more since the collector's market and all. But he never showed up in any other films or any other sh- TV shows. They had the suit, and it's a great, I mean, even Godzilla, they repurposed that suit for, uh, was, a, was an Ultraman episode? Yeah. Uh, one time. One of the suits. One of the suits. Yeah. Uh, uh, Jiris was that monster's name. And they, they glued a, like a big uh, crest. I can't forget. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I can't remember. I mean, the, the one lizard that has the the big sort of flap or crest that it uh, oh, pops up when it's threatened or yeah, whatever. Yeah, like a spitter. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Uh, Jiris has one of those. Yeah. So. But, you know, but the Jaguar, it's, and maybe that's the, the appeal. Maybe that's the what holds the fondest with so many people because people that love jet jaguar like like myself love jet jaguar <laughs> and you know maybe this because that's our only fix is that one film it's like it's like a legend like a rock star that died young you know? well i think i think it has to do with that movie is a lot of folks first godzilla movie Oh, I'll buy that. Completely. Um, which I, I guess has something to do with its history of, I guess, the fact that it got the theatrical drive-in run when yeah. it did. Yeah. With the generation that it did and its sort of ubiquity on television. For folks, particularly for folks of a certain age, Westerners of a certain age. Yeah. That's the the one, either the first one they saw or the one they remembered, you know, best yeah. from when oh, they yeah. were and a it's kid just like they with, saw it the most times. It, with any series of films or whatever, your favorite, like uh, Bond, for example, your favorite Bond or Bond movie typically is the first one you saw yeah. with anybody. And that goes with just about any series or anything like that. The first one you saw is going to hold a, a special fondness and be your favorite. And if, and if you are our age or thereabouts. Yeah. And you had one of your earliest experiences when you were a kid uh, with Megalon, Godzilla versus Megalon. It's probably Jet Jaguar is your first super robot. Maybe your only. That's another, speaking of sort of the temperament, if you will, of the Godzilla fandom, that's another yeah. thing uh, that I think I've noticed is that amongst the hardcore Godzilla fans, you have folks who are Godzilla fans exclusively. Uh-huh. and um, don't really care about any of the other Japanese special effects and sci-fi oh. fantasy uh-huh. action stuff. Yeah. 
And then you have folks whose love of Godzilla movies sort of lead them to finding all this other crazy stuff that I love so much. Yeah. And so, so there's a lot of folks who probably got into super robots after Megalon. Gotcha. And Jet Jaguar was their first. Yeah. And there's a lot of folks that didn't bother with anything after <laughs> and Jet Jaguar is their only. Yeah. But in either case, super robots are awesome. Well, yeah. Check Jaguar is awesome. That's right. The appeal. Got an awesome theme song. Is, is, it's one of those things you can't explain. It's like what I always say about the appeal of Transformers, right? Yeah. I say, it's a jet that turns into a robot. What else you need to know? If I say that, however you react defines. Because <laughs> you're either going to be like, yeah, so, or going to be like, that is the coolest thing I have ever heard said in the English language by a human being in my entire life, yeah. right? It, it's just, it is what it is. Yeah. So, well, you know, the whole, the appeal too. I mean, you talk about being a kid and seeing it the first time and the way it's, the movie is geared towards kids, where is the guy and is the little kid, the guy that builds it Jaguar, is it ever established? Is that his little brother, his cousin, his nephew? It's the professor's brother. Okay. So it's yeah. the guy who builds it Jaguar. Yeah. It's his little brother. Yes. Okay. So you have this brother who builds this giant robot or this robot who can turn into a giant robot and is your protector and friend, mm -hmm. basically. Oh, yeah. Well, there it is right there. That's the appeal. Mm -hmm. I mean, what little kid would not want a robot friend, much less a robot that can turn giant? Well, the, the fact that those three... I mean, there's there's other human actors that appear in the film, of course, but the fact that those three yeah, are are the only <laughs> prominent human characters in the movie, and they don't really get introduced. It feels as though, I mean, they sort of do, but not really, not in any meaningful way. And it feels as though you're already supposed to, you're either already supposed to know who they are yeah. or you're not supposed to care. And in either case, that's kind of one of the many things that to me makes it feel like an extended episode of a, of a uh, oh, yeah. television show from. You the, came into the middle of the character's history. Right. You just go like these three. It. They're just here doing whatever they're doing and who they are and why they're doing it. You don't know. Yeah. But they're doing it. And you don't care because Jet Jaguar. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And then Godzilla shows up. Yeah. <laughs> And then Godzilla. Yeah. And, and let's talk about the, the bad guys for a minute. The design. Gigan has already been in another film. So we've Gigan seen was him. introduced in the in the film just before this one. And That's a right. unique design. Yeah. You know. And then Megalon, very different design from stuff we've seen previous. Yeah. You know, I think that, I don't know if I ever said this before, but you know, the Nolan Dark Knight movie, you know, I think the Bane stole Megalon's look for the mouth. <laughs> Think about that mouthpiece thing. Hey, look, yeah. It looks like you know, I expected to open up a fireball shoot out of me. Oh, if only. Yeah. <laughs> then that, that then a, it would have been awesome. <laughs> that would spice that picture up some. <laughs> but the design of all four of the, the monsters or giant characters in there are pretty cool. Oh, yeah. Because some of the other ones in other films, it's like, yeah, it's okay design, you know, but Godzilla looks good. <laughs> but this one, all four of them look pretty cool. Well, Gigan looks like something a kid would come up with, just like a kid would describe. Yeah. It's got razors for f hands. Yeah. <laughs> got, hooked, got hooked razors yeah. for hands. And he, who cares? Has, has, has a bug saw, has a bus saw on its belly and a. So you mean the current editorial staff of Marvel and DC design? <laughs> oh, did I say that out loud? Don't insult whoever created. <laughs> Geigen like that. I'm sorry. That's not nice. We'll fix that in post. I like Geigen. But yeah, they all four, they look cool, and then they're going to, a good, what, third of the movie is just them on screen fighting. It's I, a good I, portion I don't know if film. it's a third, but yeah, I mean. Oh, oh, the last act, it anyway. take, yeah, oh yeah, It takes a while. It takes a while for Godzilla to join the action at all. Yeah. Well, that's true. It does the, So a good, okay, a good quarter of the picture anyway. Yeah. So we're, we're, we are... Uh, Jumping, I guess we're jumping ahead of uh, yeah. just hey Rob, it's just like old times, yeah. But uh, we're not gonna anyway. go through the whole plot, but let, let's just <laughs> well, as, a, as, as a Godzilla movie, as yeah. far as the Godzilla action, yeah. Typically, like if you if you if you time it how it works, is that you'll uh -huh. see Godzilla in the prologue briefly, uh huh, and then you won't see him again until the half hour mark. Oh, okay, and then you'll get some Godzilla action in the half hour mark, yeah, and then he'll something will happen and that will sort of blow over. And then everybody will react to what just happened with Godzilla at the half hour mark. Gotcha. And yeah. then yeah. somewhere after the 50 minute mark headed into the uh, last 30 minutes, you'll get the the big Godzilla extravaganza. And then between yeah. those two points, he'll appear a couple times. In this one, you get a little Godzilla in the prologue, which is uh, largely stock footage. 
<laughs> okay, yeah, that's true. Then I think it's like 40 something, it's like 45, 40 yeah. something minutes before you see him again very briefly. Yeah, but you should get some j- Jaguar interspersed in there. Oh yeah, well you but, get monster action. Yeah. You get Megalon on yeah. the rampage yeah. and you get some some Jet Jaguar. It moves along a pretty good clip from what I can remember. It, it It's never a point in it where you're like, oh. Well, I think there's so much monster action yeah. towards the end yeah. that you forget how long you had to wait to get there. I mean, that, that's how it seems to me. Yeah. But there's still I, there's not a point in it that I can that I can remember. It's, yeah, I, I didn't get to watch it uh, recently. Where you're sitting there going, oh god, this is this is late. This is taking so long. This is lame. Am I wrong on this? Does it? Is it? It moves along at a pretty good clip. Yeah, I mean, I, I suppose so. If you're watching it, waiting for the monsters to show up. Oh well, especially yeah. Especially if you're watching it, waiting for Godzilla to show up. Yeah, it can feel long, but if you're just letting it be what it wants and do what it wants, yeah, just kind of watching it. There's always something amusing going on for the most part. Yeah. so you're all right. Yeah, so it's, it's an enjoyable true. film overall. Yeah. But you get the monsters on the screen. And that's that's your money. That's what you've been waiting for. And well, one thing I didn't talking about how long it takes Godzilla to join the action though. Yeah. One thing I did note this time was uh, Gigan flies to Earth. From the, uh, what was it, Star Hunter M1 Galaxy. Okay. In less time than it takes for Godzilla <laughs> to walk and or swim from Monster Island to the Japanese mainland. You ever try to walk through water? <laughs> it's not easy, man. <laughs> it's like Gigan has time to fly in from space, kick the crap out of Jet Jaguar and high five Megalon before uh, Godzilla can appear on Japanese soil he, proper. He took a wrong turn to Albuquerque. <laughs> <or> <laughs> <here>. <laughs> Something. <laughs> Now, here's here's something. You're talking about how they're geared towards kids and, I guess, like a very watered down to be more family appealing and all. When it was released in the States, when it was it was the first, I think, Godzilla movie given a real big showing, like in primetime TV. And I just found this out recently. It was introduced. They made a big a deal of it. It was introduced by John Belushi in a Godzilla suit <laughs> on primetime TV. Wow. I don't remember that. I do remember a skit on Saturday Night Live of John Belushi in a Godzilla suit and Robert Wawa inter- interviewing Godzilla. And he trashes a little model city showing how he does and talking about the, you know, the rough stuff about filming. And, all this. and it had to be the same suit. But man, I gotta, I'm gonna have to look for that clip, see if I can find that mm. anywhere. John Belushi. I'm gonna say it again. John Belushi in a Godzilla suit introducing the movie to American television. Now, apparently, too, there were some, to keep like a G rating for it, there mm-hmm. were some there were cuts. And little little stuff, like when the, the airplane flies and hits the Cetopian guy in the face, oh. and a little bit of blood. <laughs> well, yeah, they he, cut he, that little bit, he is that left a out. bloody mess. Yeah, they cut that out, where the, uh, the one of the bad guys like hits the kid and locks him out, violence towards children. And they cut the part where, which is actually stock footage again, where, where Gigan uh, dive bombs Godzilla and cuts him open and the big... The blood shoots out? Yeah. I remember seeing that. Oh, okay. But I think that was cut. Oh, okay. or what, it was some, There was another scene, too, like that, that was cut, though, which it really it wasn't <laughs> that bad of a cut. I mean, you know, it wasn't anything that needed to be cut. At least it wouldn't nowadays for to get a G rating and all. We should talk about the Cetopians. Let's talk about the Cetopians. Because the Cetopians are fabulous. Let's talk about that, that banker in the... <laughs> That balding, uh, super mustached banker in the toga. The mi- middle-aged white guy in his uh, silky toga. Oh, God, with the Harry Reams mustache. And, and, uh, and, the, and the Megalon tiara. You know what it looks like? It looks like the guy, I can't remember his name right now, but it was the Judge Reinhold's partner in Beverly Hills Cop. Oh, yeah. It looks like that guy. <laughs> He looks just like that. Oh, guy. I don't remember his name either. <laughs> but yeah, that guy put a toga and a and a and a Caesar uh, leaf tiara on him. <laughs> uh, it's, it's it's a Megalon face tiara. Okay, he's got, okay. He's got a tiara with Megalon's little face on. on is that what it is? You didn't notice that? I haven't seen. I guess I haven't watched my Blu-ray. Yet. Uh, yeah, you better watch it again. Wow, I must have one of those now. <laughs> hey, speaking of things I must have, you know when they release uh, this at the theaters, it was released here in '76. They gave out at the theater. They had little buttons, little pen back buttons. Yeah. One for each monster. Wow. And I have seen a Megalon one on eBay. I have yet to see a Jet Jaguar. I must own one. That would be cool. How awesome would that be? Go see that theater. Here's your button, kid. <gasps> Jet Jaguar. <laughs> so, so the Seatopian Emperor, Togaman, 
spends his <laughs> spends his time down in Seatopia, sur- surrounded by <laughs> Japanese dancing girls wearing condoms on their heads, like you do. <laughs> <laughs> did they have? Did the condoms have little megalon faces? <laughs> <laughs> if only. <laughs> <laughs> well, that'd be a collectible Make for a you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Jesus. <laughs> Wrap that rascal in new megalondoms. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's a marketing idea right there. So, I, bet um, I bet they have in Japan. <laughs> so Toga Guy and the condom <laughs> women send their two agents up to the surface. One of them looks like Damone from Fast Times. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, um, actually, <laughs> he does. Actually, I, I thought it was Professor Snape, and um, <laughs> <laughs> it was it was. Uh, I know what you're saying, but I thought he was Japanese Alan Rickman. <laughs> it could have been <laughs> Japanese Alan Rickman and Beard Guy. And Beard Guy, that's right. Who I believe is referred to on screen only as that foreigner. <laughs> yeah, Japanese don't like foreigners, <laughs> even Cetopian foreigners. That's the rumor. Yeah. So they are sent to retrieve the robot J- Jaguar. Yes. Professor Snape and Beard Guy are sent to... How they know there's a robot J- Jaguar who isn't even completely built yet, we don't know. Why J- Jaguar was built in the first place. So a little kid can have a friend. Th- that, well, protector. everybody needs a friend. It's, it's, it's the live action version of Frankenstein. So they are Jr. sent to the service by the Emperor of Cetopia to capture Jet Jaguar because they are going to send Megalon... Who? Megalon. They're giant you gotta do the song. monster who's like a stag beetle thing. Yeah, big roach. Kabuto. Yeah. Uh, he's a stag beetle thing. With a big Teletubby thing on his head. <laughs> that, that's his, that, that's his, <laughs> that's his stag beetle horn, sir. <laughs> okay, sorry. Anyway, Megalon will be ser- sent to the surface to Rampage. However... It will be like you do. Apparently, it will be an untargeted rampage. Megalon needs someone or something to be able to guide him around so that he can rampage in the places where Toga Man wants him to rampage. Because <laughs> Megalon has a poor sense and of direction. That's apparently. what they need Jet Jaguar for. Ah, to lead him. Jet Jaguar is going to fly around, leading Megalon from place to place. Gotcha. To help the Cetopians execute their plan against the surface dwellers. Because they knew not only was this guy building a robot, this robot would be able to fly. Yeah. Okay. But what no what one know? knew is that the robot would teach itself to dr- grow into a giant in time of need. Well, because, because that happens. They should have seen it coming. It's in Japan. Yeah. Just saying. So. So that's so that's the thing, right? The two, That's the, the basic the, premise of Snape the Snape and Beard guy kidnap our heroes... As, the, as such as they are, and use the uh, control devices for Jet Jaguar in the lab to fly Jet Jaguar around to lead Megalon to wherever it is they want to lead Megalon to Rampage, which is primarily a quarry and <laughs> some stock footage from uh, Ghidorah the Three-Headed Monster, um, <laughs> among a couple of other things. Man. Megalon will now attack Tokyo. As it was years ago. <laughs> well, conveniently, Megalon's beam that he shoots out of his stag beetle horn. What He's did you What did you call it? Teletubby's head. There <laughs> you go. The plus water on his head. The I beam he shoots out of that is uh, conveniently the same as uh, <laughs> King Ghidorah's ray. I, I'm guessing that wasn't an accident. His lightning King Ghidorah's yeah. lightning breath ray, so that they can cut awesome. away to stock footage of King Ghidorah blowing shit up. Awesome. Or his Ray blowing shit up, I should say. So he's doing that. Actually, for all my picking on this movie about using a lot of stock footage, some of it is very cleverly incorporated. Oh, yeah. I have to say. Yeah. You know, it's so long between seeing those movies and now watching them close together. I don't remember anything being obvious to me that it was stock footage from something else. Well, if you're if you're super familiar with it, with the footage, then you know that you've seen it before. Oh yeah, is, well, that's is, what I'm saying. It, too long, a, too long a time yeah. between seeing them for me. Yeah, that I didn't notice. But, but to be fair, if you've got this by this point in the series, they've got this enormous library of special effects footage. Yeah, and it's not like there was a home video market where people had seen these movies over and over again, and it had been uh, just shy of ten years since Gator the Three the Three Headed Monster was oh, in. Yeah. No, oh, not since the last time they used that stock footage. My. <laughs> But almost 10 years since the first time they used it. 
All right. What so, are we talking about again? <laughs> well, we're, we're going. We're we're kind of run through quickly. Run through the plot now. Well, we're, the, we're done with plot. That's oh, okay. all there well, is no, to it. I, no, actually, I was going to ask you because I forgot. Because, like I said, I didn't get a chance to watch this before we decided to do the podcast here. So I'm going on just memory and, uh-huh. and very fond memories, by the way. But I don't remember why Gigan shows up. The Cetopians put out a distress call to the dwellers, whoever they might be, in the Star Hunter M1 galaxy or Galaxy M1, however it is said. Yeah. Send Gigan. That's all. <laughs> Just Megalon's not doing the shit fast enough. Send Gigan. Well, it is established by Japanese Professor Snape that Cetopians have <laughs> vastly superior technology. I'm still going Mike Damone from Fast Times. To uh, <laughs> whatever makes you happy. Have vastly superior technology to uh, surface dwellers. So, so maybe we can extrapolate from that that oh, they okay. have been in contact with other worlds or simply that they were uh, in contact with the, the aliens from the previous movie. All right. right. All right. It's like it when, all happened off camera. When those aliens were were hanging around trying to use a Gigan to take over the planet, uh, they hooked up with the Cetopians right. and said, "Hey, man, we like you swinging cats. You ever need anything? You let us know. We'll send Gigan because <laughs> it worked out so well for us the first time." <laughs> right on. Okay, so Gigan shows up, and our good guys have got Jag- Jaguar back under control. Right, because so Snape Damone is. Fair in enough. control of J- Jaguar. <laughs> Snape de Monson. <laughs> Snape de Monson. I will. <laughs> is in control of J- Jaguar using the laboratory controls. But aha. Uh-huh. Aha. Uh-huh. Brother Professor. Yes. Has a remote control, which apparently overrides the other controls. Little did they know. And uh, he uses those to regain control of Jet Jaguar. And sets Jet Jaguar to find Godzilla. That's right. Understand Jet Jaguar? Find Godzilla. That's right. Yeah, Jet Jaguar, find Godzilla. <laughs> I watched it subtitled, but yeah, that's... Uh, <laughs> you lost the joy of... Find Godzilla! That's, that's, that joy is all you, pal. <laughs> the beauty of subtitles is the kid could really have been a really bad yeah. actor in Japanese, and I wouldn't Never know. know. <laughs> And find Godzilla, he does. <laughs> J- Jaguar flies all the way to Monster Island. Yeah. Does his arm uh, sign language only monster sign? Uh, his air traffic control. Yeah. Uh, his sim- his monster semaphore. <laughs> <laughs> that Godzilla understands completely. Yeah. And then just throws his and thumb re- over his Let us not forget that way. Godzilla indicates that he understands this completely. With a right on. And a, with, a, with a right on, that's right. Yeah. And a, and a sage nod. And then jumps into the water, and and then the stock footage jumps into the water. <laughs> yeah, that, that yeah that and swims to mainland uh, Japan very very slowly. But he gets there. He does. And that's when the fun starts. And we should point out two things that we alluded to earlier, which is Brother Professor now has yes. remote control, but loses it because. Jet Jaguar has the ability to override external control and give himself commands. He's become sentient. And not only that, as as we said earlier, he teaches himself how to grow into a giant in time. By event. using giant monster semaphore. That's right. Yep. That's what causes it. And that's not just me saying, oh, did he teach himself? It's set on screen. Yeah. <laughs> he reprogrammed himself to be able to do that. Like you do. Because, yeah. Yeah. And we're glad he did. And we're very glad uh, he did. <laughs> but this is also, now this is... This is the the Godzilla film where we do get the the great scene at the end after they've just dispatched. Oh, don't skip ahead. Don't skip ahead. Okay. Come on. Well, now. there's the Come big on. fight. Don't give away the big because I got a lot to say about that fight now. Come on. <laughs> okay. Well, <laughs> well, let's say it. <laughs> well, for, well, before we go there, though, let us not forget the great scene or scenes after the Cetopians have lost control of Jet Jaguar and Jet Jaguar is no longer leading Megalon where Megalon is to go. Megalon is now left to his own devices. Ah, okay. Where he just starts hopscotching across the countryside. Oh. He's like jumping. <laughs> just like four feet at a yeah. time. <laughs> yeah, but not like, you know, thousand league leap travel. Not like, not like Hulk style. It's like he's, like he's doing the hopscotch. It's like he's playing hopscotch. He's just goofing around, having a good time. 
And now it's clear to us why they needed Jet Jaguar to control Megalon because left to his own devices. <laughs> he's retarded. <laughs> <laughs> it's also why he's dangerous. He's got that tar strength. <laughs> Oh, we're going to hell. <laughs> okay. So, tarred strength, right. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, he's hopscotching is what he's you're saying. He's hopscotching across <laughs> the countryside or the quarry or wherever the hell they're shooting this thing. Soundstage, whatever. Yeah. Whatever. No, I think it's, I think it's a location <laughs> oh, okay. of some kind. So, that's why uh, Jet Jaguar's leading him and they bring Guy again in and... Guy getting Jet Jaguar has taken off at that point to get Godzilla, so Megalon is left on his own, hopscotching. Well, Jet Jaguar returns to confront Megalon because you know he, he hasn't just been hopscotching; he's been, you know, stock footaging shit to death. Oh, okay, you know, right on, tear, <laughs> tearing up the cityscape, sort of stock footage and shit to death. All right, yeah, yeah. yeah. And then God uh, Jet Jaguar shows up to confront him. Okay, and I believe Jet Jaguar rescues our our forgotten protagonists <laughs> from the imminent danger of something, and uh, they tussle. They start having a, having um, do our Jetto Jaga and, investi- and, uh, and, and uh, engaging in fisticuffs. Megaro or yeah. such as it is with the drill hands. <laughs> such as it is is my the, oh, I forgot to mention the drill hands earlier. From yeah. This, uh, well, Megalon has a lot of cool powers, right? So he's yeah. got he's got Ghidorah's beam, which is you know, <laughs> yeah. again convenient. Comes out of Willie Johnson on his he forehead. He shoots napalm grenades out of his mouth. Yeah, also awesome. Yeah, he can. Uh, he's got those uh, drill hands that he can't pick up shit with. No, nah, but he can you know drill you. Yeah, and then he can burrow underground. Yeah, and pop up again. Yeah, right underneath you. There's actually speaking of clever use of stock footage, like so. There's this bit where. And uh, I hope I have this right from memory or else other Godzilla fans are going to crucify me. But uh, (laughs) there's this bit where you see the self-defense force firing at Megalon. Yeah. Megalon quickly ducks down behind something and then it cuts back, cuts back to the self-defense force and then it cuts to stock footage of, I think it is Anguirus from destroy all monsters running behind some trees but the trees are obscuring him. so all you can see is something <laughs> running behind the trees yeah. and then back to self-defense force shooting <laughs> self-defense force shooting and then back to the to, to megalon popping up like he's just been running behind wow. something right oh i gotta go look at that now it's great and to pick see if i can pick angoras out <laughs> that's awesome yeah anyway so uh they fight and then gigan arrives and the, the, the tide turns against poor old uh, Jetto Jaga, and yeah. he starts getting uh, his iron butt whipped by uh, the tag team yeah. of Gigan and Megalon. And they do tag team him, I think, don't they? Don't they actually slap claws? Well, they, they kind of high five, yeah. uh, uh, hooked a drill. <laughs> And it looks like uh, it looks like one's tagging in the other for this year yeah. wrestling match. <laughs> But then they both proceed to, to kick the shit out of, of Jet Jaguar after the tag. So if it's a tag match, then yeah. it must be an ECW style tag match. <laughs> and my wrestling people will know what the hell I meant by that. Until finally we hear the music. The Goji has come back. <laughs> and Godzilla shows up doing the Rocky pose with the arms uh, yeah. pumping above the head and everything. He does his Being little like, awesome. what is it like? stomp and rub the hands together yeah. prepared to have a judo match routine yeah, and put them up over his head like yeah because yeah. <laughs> he knows what's happening so we should talk about the suit at this point this is the the debut of what i like to call puppy face godzilla the big eyes short with snout the, the big eyes with the brown pupils and the the short snout very sort of cute Almost and, cartoon-like yeah. in a way. And, and any pretense of these being animals with animal behaviors yeah. is gone. I mean, these are just totally anthropomorphic creatures at yeah. this point. And uh, short digression, I'll try to keep it short. There was a time when I had a strong preference for the the more majestic force of nature characterization yeah. of Godzilla the more dangerous animal like characterization of okay, Godzilla gotcha. and, yeah. and was not super into this anthropomorphic superhero version of Godzilla. But being in the 
interested in all kinds of Japanese special effects movies and TV shows camp. Yeah. Um, and being in an era where it's finally possible to see a lot of this. Stuff, oh, uh, uh-huh. of, of the seventies and eighties stuff particularly, which is what I, what I tend to prefer. I, I've just sort of come to appreciate the whole spectrum of these things and the influence that all this other stuff had on Godzilla that sort of led to yeah. where we are here. And when I say that it's like a really long, it's like, it's like a long episode of one of these TV shows. Uh huh. There's a lot that goes into that. Like I said, the, the, the presentation and the fact that it seems like we're supposed to already. Oh yeah. Care. And the fact yeah, that I totally know who these that. people are and the fact that, you know, it's using super robots and all these things that were popular on television at the time. But when you get to this, the final fight, yeah. the, the, the four way tornado tag match between <laughs> these uh three kaiju and a robot (laughs) it's a sitcom it really has a lot of the appeal of that fun tv stuff but while you can argue that the anthropomorphic behaviors and the obvious budgetary cheapness of it uh do not compare favorably to the 60s godzilla movies if uh-huh. you look at it as a bigger budget version of one of the TV shows, it becomes this sort of magnificent thing, <laughs> right? Where it's just longer and more detailed and deeper and yeah. more fun than any of those other things had the time or the budget to make them. Yeah. You know what I mean? It, oh, of course. So, so that's how I see it now. And because of that, this movie has really risen in my rankings because this final, awesome. this, this final fight, which is long, is oh, so yeah. much fun. Yeah. And we keep making wrestling references and that's no coincidence because this is <laughs> no, it, very much a wrestling match. Yeah. And like a good wrestling match, a good wrestling match, they say, tells a story. And this fight tells a story. I mean, you can follow you know the 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 ups and downs and highs and lows and and turns of the tide in this match you know very clearly all the oh, way yeah, all the way yeah. through it so it's, it's all, awesome it's a lot of fun they do some great moves man <laughs> they do some yeah. cheesy moves too but they do some great moves i mean the ones that stand out is they get encircled by fire yeah okay now why godzilla can't just walk through that little circle of fire i don't know but we don't need to know because then they do something awesome yeah he puts his arms on Jet Jaguar's shoulders after Jet Jaguar does some more monster sign language. And Jet Jaguar flies them both right over to fire. <laughs> <laughs> and he's just holding on to his shoulders. And it's awesome. And as a kid, especially as a kid, you're like, that's awesome. And as an adult, I'm like, that's awesome. But, but, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just well, a little one smoother. Of, that's one awesome. Of the, one of, <laughs> but my favorite part of that, aside from the two of them flying off together, which is awesome, the other little thing that just makes it. And again, this ties into why the anthropomorphic behaviors, the, the human-like behaviors of the monsters in this movie are a strength and not a weakness Yeah, for the entertainment value of them and yeah. and, and, and how it helps them tell a, a wrestling match story, right? Uh-huh. Is it keeps cutting to reaction shots of Megalon and Gigan watching... <laughs> <laughs> the other two surrounded by fire and they're like jumping up and down and rubbing their hands together and they're all excited it looks like they're like laughing to themselves yeah. or whatever just the body language of it with the suit acting uh-huh. they're, they're just having a rip roaring good time and then when uh when uh Jet jaguar <laughs> flies them both off out of the fire uh-huh. it cuts back to the other two and they're like oh man <laughs> stomping their feet and kicking yeah. dirt <laughs> it's great oh and then the, but the move to end all moves they have dispatched guy again and guy again has said Screw you guys, I'm going home. And uh, Jet Jaguar has, it looks like he broke Megalon's arm <laughs> and he's holding him and motions Godzilla. And Godzilla backs up, takes a run and start, and slides on his tail with his feet in the air and drop kicks. Slides right into the Megalon. Tail side, uh, the tail slide drop kick. That's right. Awesome move. Awesome. I still have the same enthusiasm for it now as I did when I was a kid. Yeah. That's great. I'm waiting the whole movie just to see that now. <laughs> well, I mean, right from the very beginning of the fight, though, going back a little bit, so the the two bad guy kaiju have put the beat down on poor old uh, Jet Jaguar, who's just hurting. Yeah, they the like be, I literally beat him into the ground yeah. where his shoulders are sticking out of the dirt. <laughs> and Godzilla shows up. And the other two are like, uh oh, and they back off and Godzilla sort of circles around hey. and he gets over to where Jet Jaguar is and he's like covering Jet Jaguar so the other two will back off. Yeah. And Jet Jaguar gets up and shakes hands with Godzilla. He grabs Godzilla's arms like Spartacus style and <laughs> 
gives him the big emphatic shake of the head like thanks Godzilla that's right and then like Godzilla turns to acknowledge this friendly greeting that he's received from Jet Jaguar and that's when Megalon because he's a bitch decides to <laughs> to rush Godzilla while he's looking away uh-huh. and the fight begins yeah. and you can and then they start to tussle and you can forget about Again, animalistic biting or clawing. Godzilla is just landing haymakers, right? He's just, and at one point, he rips up a tree and just like walking talls and went. That's <laughs> right. him with a two by four with the tree. You really do. Yeah. Take that, you son of a bitch. <laughs> Uh, and then uh, Godzilla's down, and Megalon shoots one of those napalm grenades, and and uh, Jet Jaguar like is like grenade, and he, you know, <laughs> grabs it and throws it across the quarry. Then one of them like grab it, it, like I don't know if Godzilla. I think this is, he catches it and throws it back, and it goes right back down Megalon's throat. Yeah, that's and later. Smoke starts coming out of his mouth. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's awesome. Well, that's like they do that, and then it, Jet Jaguar gives Megalon the arm breaker. Yeah. Right, which is awesome. No, no, not Megalon. Uh, uh, sorry, Geigen. Oh, gives, yeah. He gives yeah, Geigen, Geigen the arm breaker. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> which is awesome. <laughs> and then that's when Geigen makes his escape, and that's when uh, they, Megalon gets up and, and Jet Jaguar holds him for the yeah the uh, drop kick. But Now they try to, one of them tries to fly away and Godzilla just atomic breaths them and they drop like a stone. Yeah, that, that happens. I can't remember if it's Geigen or if it's... Yeah, I don't uh, remember right Megalon. now. Well, it's got to be, uh, it's got to be Geigen if it's flying, so... Yeah. Well, the other thing I like is when uh, the, when Megalon and, and Gigan are both down, and Godzilla wants to make sure they're out. He goes over and gives Megalon a kick, and, yeah. And he's kind of like, "Yeah, okay, you're you're down." And he, he's satisfied. He walks away and he goes over to Gigan. He gives Gigan a kick, but clearly he's not satisfied. He kind of stays there for a minute, looking at Gigan <laughs> like, "Hmm." And then, sure enough, Gigan pops up and gives him the old buzzsaw across the shoulder routine. Yeah, it's amazing. <laughs> Godzilla knew something. He's messed with that cat before. Yeah. <laughs> Thank God for for the state of toy making today. Because the figures, when I was a kid, I would have killed to have had a Godzilla, a Jet Jaguar, Megalon Gigan figures. And there just wasn't. At least here there wasn't. In the States, the closest thing we could get was, I don't know if it was around the same time or a few years later, were the, the Shogun Warriors Godzilla, which I still have to this day. And, of course, the Shoguns, of course, Mazinga was was a stand in for Jet Jaguar mm-hmm. when I played with him, but because uh, they had the same mouth, you know. But uh, <laughs> and then uh, later on, there was I think there was a Bendy Godzilla that came out that I had, and then there was a little uh, Bandai Godzilla, which wasn't a great design. I should still had it. I don't. And a Megalon, a Bandai came out of the Megalon, but I don't remember that when I was a kid. I have it now, but I don't remember it then. But now, my God. The stuff that's come out, even the even the stuff that's not super expensive, I've got like four or five Jet Jaguar figures. My God, <laughs> my God, and I've got a Godzilla and a guy getting a Megalon that are same scale, and it's beautiful. And then the stuff like the ones that you collect, the nice, what are they about a foot and a half tall or something? Most of them, something like that. Well, some of them are uh, some of them are eight inches, and some of them are twelve inches. Yeah, those real nice ones. The scale, from, twelve yeah. inch scale, eight inch scale. Yeah, it's beautiful figures from Japan. Nothing like that back then that we could that we had access to anyway. No, but well, now in, they're beautiful. Man. In Japan at the time these were out, you had you know vinyl figures of uh, all these kaiju, which were more stylized and less accurate. Yeah. Than than even the Bandai's that you would get. Yeah. Later, so you had I think I think it was Bullmark did the vinyl Megalon and the Jet Jaguar, which um, and they did a flying Jet Jaguar too, a little like four or five inch one yeah and, 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 and i love those things i mean you know they're not screen accurate representations even to the level again that bandai would later do their stylized toys with yeah uh, multicolored paint jobs and sort of bulky shapes and whatnot yeah but they're utter, i mean they're really really charming there's some there's something about that era and style of uh japanese vinyls that uh, i find really appealing and there's a whole retro market for that stuff now uh-huh. yeah well they're fun i mean the fact that they were out i mean what did we have out at that time is that was before the big star wars boom yeah so we had migos which were awesome <laughs> but as far as monsters like that well you had the aurora godzilla kit right which yeah oh yeah uh, which is not a toy but i mean it's it's at least a figural representation yeah. of godzilla which i think is that's based on the the king kong versus godzilla uh-huh. suit yeah. right the 62 yeah which is probably my second favorite godzilla oh, i love that suit. i love that suit that's beautiful yeah beautiful 
And typically is when people think of Godzilla, that's the look they kind of think of. I don't typically. know. I don't know. Maybe not now, but it's hard for, the for me longest to say. time. Well, it's like whenever you see people think of Frankenstein or whatever, typically it's the Glenn Strange look more. And when you see people draw it, draw Frankenstein or think of Frankenstein or whatever, because that went on a lot of merchandising, yeah. you know, and that Godzilla was more seen or probably yeah, you know you're probably right because when, when i, I talked about a typical general in general you know when i talk about the ubiquity of uh godzilla megalon on television or seeming well ubiquity is a no an overstatement but the fact that that was one you could catch more easily than others yeah when we were growing up that's true but i think probably the other one that was very accessible was King Kong versus Godzilla, right? Probably because of the King Kong. Probably, probably. And that, and like connection. I said, that look was the model. Yeah. You know, and if you had... A, so partic- particularly for that 60s generation. Yeah. And even people who weren't so much into the classic monsters, if they had one of the models, it was probably Godzilla. Yeah. When did yeah. that come out originally? I was reading a book not too long ago on uh, Aurora, the Aurora monster model and the history of it all. And I don't remember when the Godzilla came out. Of course, it was one of the later ones. Well, I say later. It did. Godzilla did have a long box. Though. So it wasn't the later later, but it wasn't the first run. It was like, I think Frankenstein was first and that took off and they made a couple more, a couple more. And the Godzilla was like the last of the initial run. I cannot remember. Well, anyway. <laughs> anyway, regardless. That's Get, getting into some arcane Hey, you know what? Here. Didn't have a Jet Jaguar kit. That's all I'm saying. Yeah, they did have a beautiful one. They had the, they did the monster, monsters of the movies line, you know the snap together kits. Yeah, they had a beautiful Gator and Rodan kit though. Both of those were oh, I suspect awesome. that some of the Megalon and and some of the other seventies kaiju are, are more popular outside of Japan proportionally anyway amid you know people who actually care about the stuff one way or the other are disproportionately popular outside of Japan. Oh, I'm because, sure. Because there's just not as much product around Megalon, Jet Jaguar, Titanosaurus, as there <laughs> is uh, your Mothras and Ghidorahs and, and uh, some yeah, of the oh, other yeah. ones or yeah. whatever. I mean, they do and always have produced merchandise for those, uh-huh. but not nearly as much as some of the others. Yeah, yeah. So that, yeah, well, it's like even, even in the States now, I mean, you know, with no Godzilla movie to promote, within the last 10 or 15 years, there have been Godzilla product on the shelves of the toy store. You know, there was that line Godzilla Wars or whatever, which had nothing to do with any movie. Yeah. But you had Godzilla and they had a Mothra. There was a Gigan, I think, in that line. There was a might have been a King Ghidorah. There was a couple of other monsters. And then there was that other line that came out not long ago. And they did the different eras of Godzilla, but I think they only did like three. And again, there was a Mothra. There was a, maybe an Angorus but you didn't see a Megalon or a Jaguar. So I, I don't know. Who knows? The long tangent on, I don't know, not really related to the movie at all, but <laughs> talking about toys. <laughs> I would not say that's unrelated to the movie. No, 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 not at all. Because we did start off with Jaguar figures. Which you got an amazing one in recently. Yes, I must it did. say. Beautiful. This figure is so, and like this line that, that Tony's collecting, is so accurate that it even, it, it looks like, it's not a representation of the character. It's a recreation, scaled recreation of the suit. Right. Of the guy in the suit where you see all the little imperfections that you see on the screen in the suit or the wrinkles, the seam lines. Beautiful. Yeah. Incredible. I can't stress enough how good these figures are. And I mean, and I really like that. And some people would rather have sort of ideal or stylized concept renderings where you take what the suit represents and make it into something that looks more like a real you know creature or robot or whatever it is that you're trying to go for and and i get that that's totally cool but i like these because just those little details are what constantly draws my eye and makes it so i don't get tired of looking at them yeah there's a lot of stuff that i have even i really really like it sometimes i just get tired of seeing it yeah you know but but when you've got those little granular thing yeah just the detail the is amazing then, it, then it's all they always, they, they make me smile nobody cares about this but us you know, ah, that's, that. true. <laughs> that's true or maybe some other collectors you know, hey where'd you get that one <laughs> but well you know i'm glad uh, that you've come back around to uh liking or appreciating godzilla versus megalon in a, in a almost a new light yeah for sure you know yeah well it's a, it's there's a process with these things as a as a godzilla enthusiast i mean at first you just you caught a few on tv when you could yeah and 
when you first start really getting into it, it's you just want to see all the stuff, just, uh, oh, which yeah. is hard enough to do, yeah. at least you know back in those days. And then you go from I want to see all the stuff to I want to see the stuff in the best possible presentation. So yeah, uncut and hopefully a good print that doesn't have the color bleached out of it like a lot of the TV prints we used to see did and uh, uh, not cropped and you know see in the original aspect ratio in, in my case i like to see them in the original japanese with subtitles yeah and, and so then you get to start seeing them in their most complete form and then you know you start to sort of define your preferences where oh well this is the the kind of godzilla i like the most and whenever i see these others i'm going to hold them against that standard or whatever yeah and then eventually i got to the point where I, i've seen them all and the best presentation I can find many times and you stop watching them through the lens of be what I want you to be and start watching <laughs> them through the lens of let me just see what you are. Yeah. And, and particularly if you can put them in or, or, or for me, I mean, some people don't care about this, but if I can put them in sort of their place in time contextually, uh-huh. like I talked about with understanding what else was going on oh, in the Japanese oh, pop I, culture. I, just, I talked about this recently, yeah. actually. Yeah then it just gives you a different perspective and, and you can just sort of relax. And, and so, you know, I, I kind of got to the point, there, there really aren't any Toho Godzilla movies that I actively dislike. There are some that I like far less than others. Yeah. But yeah, uh, same in, here. In, inter- same here. just pure entertainment value goes a long way. Oh, and yeah. For pure entertainment value, it kind of, it gets hard. It is pretty difficult to beat, you know, those last 15 minutes or however yeah. long it is of, uh, of Godzilla versus Megalon. We don't even, sure. even the anticipation of it coming little snippets you're fed of J- jaguar and then megalon you know first you see the robot with no head on you're like oh okay he's building a robot finish yeah. building the robot <laughs> <laughs> and then he finishes building and then you see a little bit of him moving and stuff and then he takes off and you're like when's he coming back what's he gonna do so you, you get a little a little bit of rope a little bit of rope you know giving you a little bit each time so you have that anticipation to that final fight and it doesn't let you down once it gets there and like what you said you take it in the context of when it was made what else was going on i find that that's true with a lot of things if you enjoy it within the context of when it was made and what else was going on around i gave a talk at MarsCon on the superhero serials and preface it by okay i know that you know they're dated they're quaint they're all this i said but take into context when they were made what was going on in the world what was going on in in the comics they were taken from what society and all was generally like then they're a lot of fun take them in a historical context basically don't try to watch them with the mindset of watching the superhero movies today it's the same thing with the godzilla films you know you take into context like you said when it was made what they were working with what was going on. And I think, you know, you can see them with a little different view than if people have grown up with the ones in the the nineties or whatever, you know, now what, do you remember what your first Godzilla film was? I honestly don't. I mean, I remember I mentioned King Kong and Godzilla yeah, and I mentioned, or versus Godzilla. And I remember, uh, Godzilla Megalon being one I definitely saw in Gigan. So the, the, it would have to have been one of those three, but I don't yeah. remember which one I saw first. Yeah. Cause I know they were shown on TV a lot either. We had the 6.30 movie around here way back then. And it was 6.30 in the afternoon or evening. You'd get a movie every day. And a couple times a year, they would do Monster Week or Planet of the Apes Week, which was awesome. Now, I remember Planet of the Apes yeah, Week. But they do, sometimes they do Monster Week. Monster Week. Sometimes it'd be Universal. Sometimes it'd be B-grade. Sometimes it'd be Godzilla Week. Or they'd slip a Godzilla in there. Or Dr. Mad Blood would show a Godzilla movie or something. But the ones that were, seemed to be in rotation uh, the most were King Kong versus Godzilla. Godzilla vs. The Thing, which Mothra. And I saw Monster Zero later on when I was a little bit older, maybe. Maybe just almost a teenager. But that was late, late night. That wasn't prime time. Uh, but it was like those two. And then I saw Megalon at the theater. I don't remember a whole lot others being shown on TV until much later. Mm-hmm. you know. Because then after that, because I guess Godzilla vs. Megalon did pretty good over here because then they released Godzilla vs. the Bionic Monster, trying to cash in on the Bionic craze. Of course, it was Mecha Godzilla. That was released to theaters over here, but I didn't get out. I didn't get to see that one, though, mm-hmm. in the theater. And then that one started to show up on TV later on. Well, that, that brings us around to your point of why they, didn't they use Jet Jaguar again? And it, it even ends, if you remember, uh-huh. with Brother Professor and company saying, uh, Let's go home, Jaguar, something or other, until he's needed again, you know. Yeah. 
pointing to the fact that, that Jet Jaguar could return, but he does not. But robots don't go away yeah. because we get a robot. Oh, yeah. In the, in the very next a robot Godzilla. Godzilla movie and a, a robot antagonist. Yeah. Which I don't know that another tag team with Jet Jaguar would really have worked against that robot antagonist. That's one robot too many. Could have been. <laughs> Could have been. Yeah. <laughs> now, uh, the big food dog that we got instead, <laughs> King Caesar. <laughs> the, I don't know. The temple dog. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I wasn't a big fan of, of... I have to go back and watch it again because it's been a long time. But I wasn't a big fan of King Caesar when I saw him initially. I guess I was still stuck on Jet Jaguar. <laughs> well, I like him fine, but uh, I really like in the in the next one after that with Terror of Godzilla with Titanosaurus. Oh. That's a good one. Hey, here's here's the thing. The guy that was in the, the Gigan suit... Yeah. I don't know if he was in the previous movie guy again, but I think he also was uh, Hidora, was in the Hidora suit, the smog monster suit. You know, I'm ashamed to say there was a time when I could have told you that, but... <laughs> yeah, I think I, I read... I, I was doing, trying to do a little research you know, last night on this. Yeah, I don't remember. I think he was in that. And, and didn't one of the guys who was w- one of the bad guy monsters, didn't he eventually become Godzilla? Am I remembering that wrong? Yeah, I don't remember right. that either. Okay. I'm sorry. Not that anybody cares anyway. I mean, <laughs> not like you recognize them outside. Well, the suit. I care, <laughs> yeah, but but yeah, it's, you know, these guys just moving right along up the ranks. <laughs> yeah, but the guy that played Jaguar never heard from again. Well, that's a tragedy. Actually, I read two different accounts. I was like I said last night doing the research, and one thing on IMDb it just has one guy listed as Jaguar, but then I was looking somewhere else and I had two guys listed. As Jet Jaguar. Hmm. But I couldn't find anything else about it, and then I went to bed. But <laughs> Well, you can't forget to, before we wrap up, you can't forget yeah. to mention the uh, Jet Jaguar fight song. Oh, great theme song. Great theme song. <laughs> We're not going to sing it. I just wish it went on longer. Yeah. I have the soundtrack where it goes on longer. Oh, here's another thing. What? Speaking of the Jet Jaguar theme song, do you think uh, a lot of people's first experience uh, could have been a MST3K? Yes, I'm sure it was. Yeah. And that's the way I feel about it, too. Yeah, well, I have watched many, many hours of uh, Mystery Science Theater. I like Mystery Science Theater. and uh, Yeah. Like our friend always used to say, the movies don't have to be bad for Mystery Science Theater to be funny. They really could have do that same shtick to anything, and it would oh, yeah. be funny. Uh-huh. And I get that, but unfortunately those things have helped to shape today's general pop culture uh-huh. uh, idea of what those movies are in a way that's yeah. unfortunate. Like if you, if so I talked earlier about seeing them in the best possible shape. Well, the TV print of Godzilla versus the sea monster that they used for the mystery science theater episode on which they covered uh-huh. that movie is, I don't even know if you can legit call it pan and scan a lot of times it doesn't even look like they bothered to do any scanning or panning they just lop the sides <laughs> of, of, a, of a scope you know movie yeah it's totally bleached of color yeah dubbed as everything was dubbed you know back in the day and uh shorn of all uh-huh. context and presented like that yeah it looks like a cheap piece of crap but if you see yeah that movie in a, in a decent print it's this colorful, utterly charming romp of a movie that's often very nice to look at, yeah. very well shot. Talking about Sea Monster. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Yeah, it really is. It's I mean, been a long time since I've seen that one. And so it's not. So it's like, look, if you if you see the real movie and you still think it's laughable, okay. I mean, that's your opinion, but it, yeah. it, it's just a little irksome that this sort of mutilated and riffed upon. <laughs> uh, version of something like that is is the one that people go oh yeah i remember that ha, yeah. ha. And i'm like all right i can say that about several other oh yeah. things that they did even though i like the show yeah you know? wait let's before we wrap up here let's talk about that just say the print of godzilla versus megalon you know for the longest time i had a vhs copy I had a bad yeah. vhs copy then i had a better vhs copy then it finally for took forever and it finally came out on dvd but this was after Blu-rays had come out I, yeah. and were taken off. So I waited and I finally got it on Blu-ray. Yeah. Now that is the nicest print that's available right now. Yes. Correct? Okay. Yes. Uh, I'm not, can't remember who put it out. Yeah. Oh, was it Media Blasters? Could have been. It's easy to get it. You can get it on Amazon, uh, relatively cheap. 
they even had it at the FYE uh, had copies of it, so it's easy to find. If you like the Godzilla movies, this is a must for the collection, or at least a viewing, and that is the best print of it available. So go out and get it now. Yeah, it's it is crazy to me, and not not all, not all of the Godzilla movies, unfortunately, are available on Blu-ray here yet in the in the states yet. Yeah, but all of the second and third series are the the Heisei oh, and Millennium uh-huh. complete, all of it. Wow. Just, you know, as good a presentation as the in terms of you know audiovisual presentation uh-huh. as the Japanese Blu-rays because it's the same transfers yeah and uh, subtitles so great right if you are into that sort of thing <laughs> uh, unfortunately not all of the the 60s and 70s movies are out yet but I think it'll happen you know, and, there, and there are some of them that are out yeah um, actually no 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 actually no, I was gonna say all the 70s ones aren't right, but they're not because the Mecha Godzilla movies aren't but yeah I mean you've, we've got a few and uh, hopefully more on the way but there is a criterion blu-ray of the first godzilla movie oh yes yes how yes, crazy yes. is that <laughs> that is not the world from which i emerged you know <laughs> i mean it, it is insane to me i was actually talking to somebody about this recently it is insane to me to think of all the different home video iterations of some of these movies oh, i have geez. owned in just the past 15 years or so uh-huh. right from VHS to a better VHS copy to I am given to understand that some people manage to acquire subtitled bootleg copies of the Japanese DVDs back in the day I'm not saying I condone this I, behavior I've, I've heard about that I am yeah. just given to understand that some people have done <laughs> these things to Hong Kong DVD releases to yeah. finally US DVD releases that are less than ideally presented and now we have these blu-rays which are pretty ideally presented yeah but to have gone from a period where it actually took quite a bit of work to see all of these movies uh-huh. if you did not live in a in an area that happened to do a lot of this stuff theatrically because there, there are a couple of those that yeah are there yeah to now is is nuts but it's cool. You know, I'd, yeah. I'd much rather uh, have easy access to, to the best material. <laughs> <laughs> of course. I mean, yeah. the adventure of hunting it. Oh, that's a thrill. I'll, I'll always have some nostalgia yeah. for that. But uh, but to be able to just to sit down and go, okay, I want to watch this and I want to see yeah, everything. I mean, thank goodness if you decide, if you get a wild hair and decide, I'm going to watch this Ibira Horror of the Deep or Godzilla versus the Sea Monster, whatever you want to call it, that this uh, weirdo is talking about. Yeah. You can sit down with a really nice looking presentation of that movie and see yeah. it for what it actually is. Or even if, Godzilla vs. Megalon. If you don't like what it actually is, <laughs> hey man, that's your taste, but at least you can see it. Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, and there you have it. I think we about did it. I think we wrung this um, thing dry. Hey, you know, we I know we're going to record a couple more here soon together. And here's a thought. Since we're on Kaiju, Giant Monsters, there's one, there's one I think we, we need to do. One, it may be a short one. I don't know. <laughs> But we should give consideration to Super Inframan. Just yes. saying. Just throwing that out there. All right. We're going to leave with that. <laughs> <laughs> and thanks for uh, being back, Tony. Uh, we're Like I said, we're going to do a few more uh, here soon together. Uh, not to mention probably the, the three-way, uh, which will probably be a three-parter with Dr. Sayer. On we're, the finally Carl, got, we're finally going to have Carl Frankenstein series. I've been talking about it for a while. We're going to... Uh, <laughs> Clayton, I've been looking forward to this one for a long time, buddy. <laughs> Via satellite in the lounge. Oh, it's very exciting. <laughs> That'll be coming up before too long, I promise. But until then, thanks for listening. Good night, everybody. Good night, everybody. Good night, everybody.